Ladies and gentlemen, as soon as you turn in your quiz and your map, please take out your notebook and your whiteboard. We are moving very quickly today. So please listen very carefully as you're transitioning. Um, please listen. I need to record two videos today. So because I'm recording two videos today, you're going to be a little bit bumped. It's not going to be as super cohesive as I've done. So I'm going to finish the French Revolution with you. We're going to go through Napoleon, and then I'm going to jump to Mexican Revolution, okay? So we're going from Revolution 2 to Revolution 5. I'm sorry, but I need to make sure I cover all my content today. Is everyone clear? Hello? That's important too, yes? So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to finish uh, the French Revolution. I'm going to jump to 5, then we'll go to Latin America, and then we'll end in Haitian. So, if I don't get to Haitian, which is probably realistic, can we agree? It's already been recorded and it will be in my video, and you can just fast forward to the Haitian Revolution. Is everyone clear? Okay, so, there's too much content. We need to move fast, and so there's going to be two videos for the day. That is why it's going to be a little bit segmented for you guys, and I'm so sorry to tell you that, but that's life. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the leader of the American Revolution? Who is the leader of the American Revolution? What do we got? Jack. George Washington. George Washington. On your whiteboard, what year was the Declaration of Independence signed? Good. Gabby. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of uh, the, pe uh, the peace treaty that ends the American Revolution? Good. What is it? Miranda. Peace of Paris. Peace of Paris was signed in what year? Good. Carly, on your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the final battle of uh, the American Revolution? It's a super cute time. You should see it. It's really cute. It's in Virginia. More. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of... Uh, please tell me how many stages of the French Revolution are there? Good. Mackenzie. Three. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the first uh, stage. Good. Lauren. French Revolution. French Revolution. The French Revolution is going to start with the falling of what structure? It only has eight people in it. It's more of a symbolic thing. What do we got? Mary Ellen. Bastille. The Bastille, which is an old like medieval prison. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is it called, the legislative body in France that only gets called every couple hundred years, and it sucks? Good. Michael. States General. Okay. Uh, in the Estates General, how many estates are there? Good. How many estates are there, Lopez? Three. The third estate is going to exit when Louis the Sixteenth calls upon them to pay more taxes. They go stand out in the tennis courts and they decide to rebel. What is the name of the document that comes out of this conversation? Ignore it. Good. Good. Uh, what is it? Callie. Tennis court accords. Tennis court accords is the official start of the French Revolution, but nothing really happens to the Bastille. On your whiteboard. Please tell me, what is uh, the second part of the French Revolution called? Good. Tessa. Reign of Terror. The Reign of Terror is led by who? I can't do this. Give me his last name, people. Carly. Robespierre. Robespierre is part of what political party? Who is it, Michael? Jacobian. Who can raise your hand and let me know where we left off on our notes? Because I know you're a little bit ahead. Ellie. Um, you were saying that they were too extreme. Okay, so the perfect. Okay, so let's talk about, let's finish uh, Maximilian Robespierre. So. Under the Jacobians, they are going to remove the Catholic Church and other religions from France. They are going to redo the calendar. You don't need to know details. You just need to know that you're going to redo the calendar, and they're going to start executions. Okay, They're going to execute 
um, about 40,000 people, and they're going to imprison about 300,000. Most of those 300,000 are actually going to die in prison, by the way, so keep that in mind. Okay? You have a big star underneath that that says it's way too extreme. Is that correct? Perfect. So, it's way too extreme. However, the Jacobians are also going to create what we call the directory, which is brand new information to you. Okay? They are going to create the directory. Okay? With that being said, it is a legislative branch to try to calm down tension in France. Okay? It's created uh, in order to try to calm down tensions in France. Okay? It's not going to last long. What do you got? It's, it's not by the Jacobians. So it's going to be done after them. But it, all you need to know, the directory is in place. Okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, do you think this revolution is going smoothly or is it spiraling out of control? It's spiraling out of control. The people of France, do you think the people of France are happy or pissed off? Do you think the French are looking good around the world or is everyone like, holy shit, what a shit show, right? Look at this disaster, everything is terrible, everything is going horribly wrong. Okay, so the people of France are not pleased and that's how we get Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay, so skip the space center. Okay, so Napoleon. Now, he is the only person throughout all of history that you can call, I, okay, except Jesus. You can call Jesus and Napoleon by their first names, okay? That is perfectly fine. Everyone else, give me their last name or homeland. All right, here we go. So Napoleon, you need to know he did fight in the French Revolution. He did fight in the actual French Revolution and became a general at 24. You should know that. By being a general at the age of 24, what does that tell you about him? Is he a dum-dum or is he absolutely brilliant? He is an incredibly brilliant military strategist. With that being said, in 1799, he is going to overthrow the Directory, or the government of France. 1799, he is going to overthrow the Directory, or the government of France. As soon as he overthrows the Directory, he's going to create a new government called the Consulate. He formed a new government called the Consulate. So, the Directory falls and he replaces it with the Consulate. Then he's like, ah, you know what would be better? Me. Then he appoints himself Emperor in 1802. So, Napoleon overthrows the Directory, creates the Consulate, and then overthrows the Consulate by naming himself Emperor of France. Alright, so 1802, you should have that date down. That's the first time he gets crowned emperor. Do you have to memorize it? No, but you should be keeping an eye on the times. Okay? Alright, so now, the first thing that Napoleon does when he comes into power is to agree, create the Concordiate. You need to know this document, it's a very important document. The Concordiate, which is written in 1801, which you definitely need to know. Okay? Under Napoleon, he signs the Concordiate. 1801. Okay, so under Napoleon, he signs the Concordiate with the Pope. It allows the Catholic Church to come back to France. Okay, Catholic Church is allowed back in France. Why are they allowed back in? Because they were, they were kicked out under the reign of terror. Now he's letting them back in, except. They can't own the churches. The churches belong to France. Okay, so they are renting land from the French. So who's making money off the Catholic Church? Who's the only country in the world who makes money off the Catholic Church? France. So when uh, Notre Dame burned down at the beginning of the year, remember that? Okay, everyone's like, why are all these billionaires throwing money into this? The Catholic Church has plenty of money. Yeah, the Catholic Church does have plenty of money, but who didn't own it? The Catholic Church didn't own it. So when it burned down, it was literally the responsibility of the French people in order to rebuild it because the French government got it in the reign of terror. All right. You also need to know, and you should put a star under this, under the Concordiate, religion is now, uh, you now have freedom of religion. Under the Concordiate, 
All people in France now have the freedom of religion. So the Concordiate is important for two reasons. One, it allows the Catholic Church back into France, but they don't own their buildings. So it's the only country in the world that makes money off the Catholic Church, which is pretty damn impressive. Second thing, it allows freedom of religion. So it's not just the Catholic Church, but it's a big agreement with the Catholic Church. Because most uh, French people are Catholic. Okay, so then you need to know Skip a Spade, and then your next major document is called the Napoleonic Code, and you absolutely need to know in 1804. Your second major document is the Napoleonic Code. You need to know it is the most replicated civil code in the history of the world. Does anyone know what came second? It's created by the Romans. Andrew? It's the 12 tables. 12 tables come second. Napoleonic Code is the most replicated code in the history. Alright, so Napoleonic Code is created in 1804. It is creating a patriarchal society <coughs> again. Now, women had some rights before the Napoleonic Code. Now we're back to no rights. Okay? <clears throat> Women lose rights under Napoleon. Women lose rights under Napoleon. You were straight up property. Beforehand, you had you were treated a little bit more humanely, not just property, under the Napoleonic Code. If your husband wanted to kill you, you shouldn't have pissed him off. You know, you should have made a better sandwich, or whatever you're making for dinner was not up to par. It's your fault, ladies, okay? Come on now. Your property. Okay? So, you need to know that all men are equal in front of the law. Now, when we say men, do we mean men and women? No, 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 no. We're property. Yeah, all like all races are equal, just no. Okay, so Napoleonic Code. You also need to know that Napoleon is using uh, propaganda as well as secret police to do his bidding. Okay, he uses propaganda and uh, secret police. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, do you think everyone respects France, or is, do you think France is the butt of everyone's joke? The butt of everyone's joke. I mean, yeah, they've been killing themselves for like 20 years at this point. Uh, I mean, not 20 years, about 15 years at this point. And so, uh, do you think French people have a big ego or a small ego? They have a huge ego. And to be the butt of everyone's joke and everyone being like, oh my god, these savages. And if you think of French people today, do you think of them as savages or incredibly refined? incredibly refined, correct? So all of a sudden, these French people are like, look at the world. Everyone thinks we're a bunch of savages. So Napoleon's like, you know what, let's go teach them a lesson. And everyone's like, ah, so let's go kill them. So instead of killing only French people, they decide to go killing everybody. Welcome to the Napoleonic Wars. Gentlemen, that's your next heading. Okay, so Napoleon is tired of being the butt of everyone's joke and everyone making fun of Prince and how they're a bunch of savages. So he's like, oh, you think I'm a savage? I'm going to show you. And that's what he does. He conquers three quarters of Europe by either all-out war or alliances. That's pretty impressive. So, Napoleonic Code. No, Napoleonic Wars. He conquers three quarters of Europe either by uh, all out war or alliance. What does all out war mean? Yeah, he literally, like, for instance, he goes into Spain and conquers Spain with a military. The Spanish military fight, the French military fight, and the French military like, stomps them. And then, ta da, we win you. Then you have places like the Netherlands who are like, Napoleon's looking at us. Oh my god, take us! <laughs> we surrender! We'll sign away everything. It's yours, Napoleon. And Napoleon's like, awesome. I didn't even have to like step in that country and I got that country. That's how he got three quarters of it. Kind of like the monsters, yeah. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, you need to know his biggest mistake is the failed invasion of Russia in 1812. You absolutely need to know that it's in 1812. His biggest mistake is his failed invasion of Russia in 1812. Okay, so, 
Because of that, we have a long chain of events. So, he loses three quarters of his men. You need to know that. Because of long supply lines and the weather. Three quarters of his men died because of long supply lines, which means they don't have enough food, they don't have enough medicine, their uniforms are also totally wrong. And then weather is going to have a huge effect. It starts snowing in Russia. Okay. All right, so after that, he gets back to France. When he returns from his failed attack, he gets exiled to Elba. You need to know that. When he gets back to France, he gets exiled to Elba. He stays there for a while. He's there for a couple years. And then he returns to France for a hundred days. Okay, so he gets exiled to Elba. At Elba, he's there for a couple years. Then he uh, liberate. Then he escapes and goes back to France. He's in France for one hundred days. You need to know that. They crowned him emperor a second time. <laughs> Can you imagine being emperor once and then you have to do it twice one time? Anyway, so he gets crowned emperor for 100 days. Then he goes to Waterloo and gets defeated by the British. You need to know that. Goes to Waterloo and gets beat by uh, Beef Wellington, or the Duke of Wellington. I remember it, don't judge, but obviously you didn't make Because the French are tired of killing their rulers because everyone's kind of judging them for it, so they're like, okay, we won't kill you, but we'll send you some shit. Now, today, if, like, for instance, if China invades the United States today, they're not going to kill Trump. They won't kill Trump. They're going to exile him, which means Trump will be in some foreign country for the rest of his life under either military arrest or something else. They're not going to execute him. Because if you start a precedent of executing the ruler and you're the ruler of China, the next person who's going to come in, what are they going to do to you? They're going to execute you. So, like, you treat your captors the way you want to be treated, especially when they didn't kill him. So, he goes to Waterloo and he loses at Waterloo and then he's exiled for a second time to St. Helena. And you need to know that. For a hundred days he's back. He goes to Waterloo, gets defeated at Waterloo, and then he's exiled for the second time and then he dies in 1921 because he gets drunk and falls down the Do we have to know who defeated him? No, I mean, people Wellington. Kind of, it should be kind of common knowledge. Haven't you heard that name before? Duke of Wellington? You've heard of Waterloo, right? Do yeah. you know why you knew Waterloo? Have you heard of it before? Alright, so congratulations. That was Napoleon. I hope you enjoyed him video. I cut out all of the other stuff. Sorry. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go to the Mexican Revolution. So, skip the space, center it. Mexican Revolution and Mexican Revolution, we're going to write five next to it. Why are we writing five next to it? Oh, God. Well, I know you're second period and you don't use words, but like pretend like you do. Sean, why are we putting five next to Mexican Revolution? Because it's the fifth revolution. It's the fifth revolution. So we're going out of order. We did one, two, and three. We did two, three. We didn't get eight. So we did one and two, and now we're jumping to five. Here we go. So, you need to know that when the Napoleonic Wars begin, write this down, when the Napoleonic Wars begin, Mexico sees its opportunity for freedom. Why would Mexico see its ideal uh, time for freedom with the Napoleonic Wars? Why? What's the colonial power doing? Daniel. Yeah, they just got invaded and conquered by France. They got a lot going on at home. They don't necessarily have a ton of time going on over here. Okay? So, the Napoleonic Wars are in full fight. Okay? So the Mexicans are like, this is our time. We're going to get our independence. You need to know the first, I would put a one next to him, Miguel de Hidalgo. He is a priest. You should know that. He is the first person to lead the revolt. He is very successful. 
<coughs> it's very influential. However, he gets captured, executed. Welcome to Mexican politics. Is it the same thing happening today? Yes. Okay, so priest Miguel de Hildago is your first leader of the first of the Mexican Revolution. He gets captured, he gets executed. Your second guy, and I would write number two, is Augustin de Iturbide. Okay, now Augustin de Iturbide is actually going to declare independence. He is very successful. Okay, he is going to actually declare independence. Miguel de Hidalgo just wanders around and is like, let's be independent, war of independence, yes, let's fight, yes. And then it's Augustin de Turbide who is like actually declares independence, who is actually putting on like uh, organizing, okay? Now, he is going to be executed. <laughs> Executed, and then we'll have a Santa Anna come into power. He is your number three. He is your number three. Okay, so Santa Anna is your number three, and he is actually going to achieve independence from Mexico. Santa Anna is actually going to achieve independence from Mexico. Guess what happens to him? He gets executed too. But we'll deal with that later. <coughs> Other people. So if you're the leader and Daniel wants to be the leader, he's just going to kill you and Daniel's off the dinner. Welcome to Mexican politics. It's still happening this way. Okay, that's Mexican. That's all you need to know for them. Okay, um, a couple of big things that I do need you to know for your test. Now, I would take a photo of this. Okay, tomorrow you do have a question on your test where it says, which of the following is not paired up correctly? So, ladies and gentlemen, we're in, uh, we're in second semester. We are in the second part of the uh, content. It's all names and people in case you haven't figured that out yet. So, here we go. So, Major, you're heading now. We're through revolutions, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to do major changes in political ideas. That's your new heading. Major, uh, major changes in political ideas. Okay. First thing, we have two types of government structures. We have conservatives and we have liberals. Oh my God. Does that sound familiar? Yes, you need to know. There's a thing called con uh, conservatives who hate revolution. You need to know that. Conservatives hate revolution and favor slow changes. You need to know that. They believe, yes, fine, change is good, but we need to have this slowly. We can't be like the French. And then we have liberalism, okay? They believe that they cannot stop revolutions. They are pro-revolutions, and they are change everything to better suit the people. So we have two types of major political thoughts, and you're either conservative or a liberal. You either support the revolutions or you don't support the revolutions. All right. Now. You do need to know slavery is, uh, the end of the slave trade is occurring. Okay. Britain is going to be the first one to uh, outlaw it. Okay. Britain is going to be the first is the only thing you need to know for. Um, I think you're okay. Okay, women in the Enlightenment. Women in the Enlightenment. Okay. Most Enlightenment thinkers disregarded women. Except one, Rousseau. What? 
What a guy. What a dude. Rousseau, he thought women should receive education so we can better educate our sons so they can be better patriots. Isn't that nice, ladies? We're only here to serve our sons. <laughs> Shoot me in the face. You need to know that there is a woman named Mary Estelle who believes women are born into slavery because they're women and not treated with rights. It's pretty cool. She's pretty popular, too. Okay, and then we have Mary Woolenstone Craft, and she's the foundation of the women's rights movement in, the, in America. She is the foundation. Mary Woolenstone Craft is your foundation of a women's rights for the whole world. She's boss. So the fact that all of us women in this room have the right to vote and we are not considered property anymore uh, is because of her. She's boss. Yeah, of course. You don't point out, hey, we're slaves, and be like, we're cool with it. When you call yourself a slave, is that a positive thing or a negative thing, Daniel? Yeah, so do you typically want to stay in the negative or in the positive? Oh, well, sweetie, she was born in the 1666, and she died in 16, 1731. How much of the power do you think the, my, my girl had? Did she do anything about it? Yeah, she wrote a bunch of papers. She became incredibly influential. Uh, she went around and lectured and spoke and uh, raised awareness about women's rights. But it's not until Mary Wollenstonecraft that people actually start really starting to change these ideas. But if Mary Wollenstonecraft wouldn't have existed unless a Mary Estelle existed, okay? All right. Now, um, we've already kind of covered that. All right. We have the development of nationalism. That's your new heading, the development of nationalism. This is the theme that will go for the rest of the year, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Donald Trump's, what's his big quote? What's his theme of his reelection campaign? America Keep America great. Because last year, uh, when he got elected for the first time, what was his quote? Make America great. Now it's keep America great, okay? Keep America great is nationalistic. Okay, it's all about nationalism. What is nationalism? Okay, it is a deep belief, and you need to write this down, a deep belief that your country has special traits that make it unique. Nationalism is the deep belief that your country has some special treat, traits that make it unique. Now, we're Americans. Every one person in this room is an American, or you at least know of the American culture. Can we agree? Okay, with that being said, Americans, are we known for apologizing, or are we just saying, America, yeah, and we just like walk around and smash through things, correct? As an American, that's who we are, okay? With that being said, that is nationalistic. We think we are the most powerful country in the world in every regard. Are we the most powerful country in the world? Yes. Are we the best at everything? No, but can you tell an American we're not good at something? Nope. Welcome. It's part of our national culture, and that's nationalism. Okay? Now, we have two types of nationalism. There's cultural nationalism and political nationalism. Cultural nation nationalism is... Like France. Ladies and gentlemen, who is more culturally aware? The French are or Americans? Hello? The French. The French. Okay? They, like, know things. Like, we drink. Like, eat and drink terrible food. Have you seen our McDonald's? I mean, I love the fries. Don't get me wrong, but, like, gross. If you go to, like, a fast food restaurant in France, you're going to be blown away. The food is like incredible because they care about their food. We as Americans were like, give us the sugary salt. Yes. Which I also love, by the way, as a proud American. But that's cultural nationalism. We also have political nationalism. Political nationalism is country first, people second. 
political nationalism. It's country first, people second. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, it is when you put the benefit of the country above the individual. Okay. Lopez, you had a question? Oh, yeah. Is fast food, like, healthy? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. For instance, like, you can get, like, a baguette and, like, cheese and, like, ham on, like, the best sandwich you've ever had in your life from a gas station in France. Italy also has bomb gas stations. Like, they're amazing. Like, you're like, ew, we're going to a gas station, and you're like, oh my god, give me all the food. It's so good. They just care more about their food and where the food comes from than we do. Like, I mean, you people eat things out of microwaves every day, don't you? I eat my lunch because I have to heat it up because I can't eat cold food because that shit's gross. But, like, how many of you eat regularly from a microwave? Do you think they do that in France? Italy? Spain? No, it's American. All right, here we go. I am skimming so much. All right. Nationalism is also going to create Zionism. And it's created by Theodore Herzl. You should know what Zionism is. Zionist movement is it's Jerusalem. All right, what it is, it is about that the Jews deserve their homeland back. And it's going to start, you don't need to know this, but it starts in, uh, in the 1890s. This whole movement, 1890s. So like 100 years before they actually get it. So it's pretty impressive that it worked out. So <clears throat> Zionists is the belief that the Jews deserve their homeland back in the Middle East. And it's this whole idea. Will it work out for them? Yeah, we have Israel today. That's a Zionist movement. Okay, so you do need to know that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the Congress of Vienna is a huge deal. Put a big star next to it. We're going to refer to this all the time. I can tell you in your essays for your LEQ and maybe even your DBQ, you will be writing the Congress of Vienna down as evidence for something. All right, the Congress of Vienna is the treaty that ends the Napoleonic War. You need to know that. It is the treaty that ends the Napoleonic Wars. It is the rule book for both World War I and World War II, by the way. So, when you're asking, like, what is okay in law and um, war and what is not okay, it's the Congress of Vienna that we go back to. Okay. You need to know that the Congress of Vienna is about breaking down Napoleon's empire. Who gets what? After Napoleon fails, okay, and is loses at the Battle of Waterloo. They have to figure out what of his goes to, goes where. The whole goal is to restore the balance of power. And I would put a star next to it. It's about restoring the balance of power. That's like their big thing, is restoring the balance of power. No one nation is more powerful than the next. Why? Because Napoleon came in and beat them all for a long time. So, okay, it is also going to try to suppress nationalism, which is a big problem. It, the Congress of Vienna makes it illegal for another country to invade another country. And upsetting the balance of power. It is not okay for a country to invade another sovereign country to invade. It's officially written down as a law. Okay. Then you need to know the unification of Italy is your next heading. Unification of Italy. It's all because of nationalism. You need to acknowledge that. Nationalism is going to cause the unification of Italy. It is first done okay, by Count Camillo Cavour and Giuseppe Garibaldi. It is unified by these two men. You 
these two men are going to unify it. Then King Vittori Emmanuel II will rule it. So for Italy unification, of course, it can't be easy. You have three people. So Count Camillo di Cavour and Giuseppe Garbaldi are going to go around and essentially fight all of these kingdoms, unify them, and then King Vittori Emmanuel II is going to rule it. Now, King uh, Vittori Emmanuel II is going to exist until, um, does anyone know who is going to lead Italy during World War II? Mussolini. Mussolini. Mussolini is going to kill him. Alright, so that is Italy. Then we're going to have the unification of Germany, which is also caused by nationalism. The unification of Germany is going to be done by nationalism. And it is only done by one man, and his name is Otto von Bismarck. Now, ladies and gentlemen, get very comfortable with that name, because Otto von Bismarck is going to be haunting us for the next six weeks. He is going to start the Industrial Revolution in Germany. He is going to wage war in World War I. And, um, yeah, he's a big deal. So we're going to keep coming up. So Otto von Bismarck is the guy who unifies Germany. Okay. All right. Here we go. To the board. Let's review some of that stuff. If you are anti-revolution and you think revolution, uh, change should come, but change should be slowly, what type of political ideology are you? More. Conservative. Conservative. If you believe revolutions are good and we should move as quick and as fast as we possibly can, you believe in what type of ideology, Carly? Liberalism. On your whiteboard. Please tell me, when we deal with Italian unification, give me the three men behind it. I would just give me their last names, people. Who are the three men behind Italian unification? Good. Who are they, Callie? On your whiteboard, please tell me who's the dude behind German unification. He's like a scary man too. Like you don't want to mess with this guy. Who is it, Maddie? Bismarck. Bismarck. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the woman who is the foundation of women's rights? The West. Now, who is it, Lauren? Mary Wollstonecraft. Wollstonecraft. Mary Stell starts it, but like she's not the foundation of it. I know. I know, we give her cred for, like, doing cool shit, but, like, it's Mary Wollstonecraft who really gets things going. Does that make sense? On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of, what is it called when you have a deep devotion to your country and you put your country's needs above the individual? There's two types of this. Good, Jack. Nationalism. Nationalism. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is uh, the name of the treaty that ends the Napoleonic Wars? Good. What is it? Michael. Congress of Vienna. On your whiteboard, Napoleon is going to overthrow the Directory and create what government that he will eventually overthrow in 1802 when he names himself Emperor? Who is it, Andrew? Consulate. Consulate. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the dude who starts the Mexican Revolution? What is the name of the dude who starts the Mexican Revolution? God, I'm exhausted. Good. Daniel? El Dago. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the dude who actually gets Mexico independent? Good. Well, we got a bunch of answers. Ethan. Santa Ana. Santa Ana. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is. Um, please tell me. Okay, here we go. We're going to go. All right, 
so we are going to go to Haiti. We are moving so fast today. Are you proud? You see all this content? This is wonderful. So we're at the Haitian Revolution. This is Haitian. We're going to put a number three behind it. Why are we putting a number three behind it? The Third Revolution. So the Haitian Revolution. You need to put a big star and recognize that it is the only successful slave revolt in history. They deserve that respect. You need to acknowledge it. That is hella impressive. Okay. You need to know that it is the most important colony to the French at the time. It is the most important colony to the French. So it's not like they didn't care. However, they're still going to get their independence. This is happening during the Napoleonic Wars. You need to know that. Okay, so you need to know that the French, the British, and the Spanish are going to try to put down the rebellion when it begins. You need to know that. Why would the Spanish and the British come to the French aid with this like huge slave rebellion. Why? Why, Lopez? Okay, sort of. Guys, look at how the American Revolution, the defeat of the British, caused all these major events. Can we agree? Imagine if we have a slave revolt. What are all three of those countries depend on? Slavery. So if we had a successful slave revolt, it could trigger more... Slave revolt. So that's the reason why. Ladies and gentlemen, go and uh, pick up my video from the Haitian Revolution tonight. Nice job today. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. You have a test tomorrow. 25 questions. 35 minutes. It's time. Yeah. Oh my god, that was exhausting.